So that's the religious <coughs> opposition. Uh, but if you're going to be an open-air preacher, of course, uh, you're going to be opposed. And one of the first things God was, uh, you know, really hammering into my heart uh, when he was preparing me for open-air ministry was rejection. It seemed like the, that was just the repeated theme I was reading and learning all throughout the Bible. Rejection, rejection, rejection. And uh, it's not rare. It's to be expected. It's to be a regular part of your life uh, if you're going to be a servant of God. Now, uh, one day I was um, watching the news and I uh, heard that there was a big uh, biker rally just not far from me, about an hour away. And uh, they said they were going to be partying late into the night. And I thought, man. Sounds like an invitation. Said, said that. there's thousands and thousands of bikers out there all day long, and they're going to party late into the night. And I had missed the day party. I, if I had known there was going to be thousands of bikers out there all day, I would have gone. Uh, so I got in my car and I wanted to at least make it for the night crowd. And I uh, had a bullhorn and a banner and uh, uh, went out there, ventured out by myself. And uh, found it was Mom's Biker's Bar. Yeah, Mom's Biker's Bar. And sure enough, there was thousands of bikers hanging out, you know, partying. It's some type of fundraiser. And so I start preaching and uh, lifting up, you know, my voice and amplifying it through the bullhorn, just preaching right there on the front. It was on like a, a side dirt road, this old biker bar. And, you know, I got, had my banner. Got a lot of attention. And then this one uh, biker came, real, you know, tall, uh, round, big man. And uh, he, starts, he starts bumping me and shoving me, uh, you know, away from, from the bar, down the road. And, uh, you know, given his size, there was really no way I could, you know, push him back. Yeah, it just wasn't going to happen. And so I get pushed about... Uh, I don't know, maybe two or three blocks away. Wow! And uh, and then when we, when he then he finally stopped and said, "You stay there." Wow. And I looked up to him and I said, "You could beat me bloody all night long, but I'm going to be preaching to those sinners over there." <laughs> yep. He he was surprised and he said, "Well, I don't want to get violent." <laughs> I said, "Well, you're going to have to because I'm not going to stop." And so he just turned around, walked away, and I walked back with him and started preaching again right in front of the bar. Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, then, there, then there's the bikers for Jesus out there. Oh, oh boy. With all their Christian patches on. Oh, yeah. Partying with all the bikers late into the night. All the Baptists. <laughs> so now it was their turn to try and, uh, you know, deal with me. So they came up to me and said, you know, we're, we're out here. We're working on these people. We're trying to get them saved. Oh, yeah. There's no reason for you to be here. You don't need to be here. Yeah. I said, well, do you at least tell these people that they're wicked? And they were offended. Said, these people are not wicked. I said, then why are you trying to get them saved? Yeah. And they turned around and walked away. Had nothing to say. Yeah. Southern Baptist. Yeah. And then, uh, then a guy started just revving his motorcycle, and, and you know, there's a dirt road, so all, and all the dirt starts flying and, oh, yeah. and making lots of noise, drowning it out. I can't preach over that, even with a bullhorn. Sure. And uh, the smoke uh, blocked. I couldn't even see the oh. biker bar anymore. <laughs> it, and and I, I was worried this is, you know, when they're, they're going to come and get violent, and yeah. he's, he's going to drown out what's going to happen next. Uh -huh. But nothing happened. The, sm got. the smoke cleared. And uh, I think he ended up peeling off and leaving. And uh, when the smoke cleared, or the dirt cleared, uh, everyone at the biker bar was paying attention. Wow. Wow. Praise God. And so I started preaching. And then I had, I had a captive audience for a few minutes until they finally went back wow. to party. But there, the whole biker bar, all the thousands of bikers, eyes on me. <laughs> sure. Wow. And so I got to preach to them. But uh, in order to get to that point, I had to overcome some opposition. Yeah. yeah. You know, opposition always comes from the very beginning. You have to overcome it. Usually, you know, when a preacher first starts preaching, is when he starts dealing with a, a lot more opposition. And as you persevere and overcome, uh, it seems to be a, a bit less. You know, but when you first start, you know, going, it just seems like opposition is opposition, constant. Yeah. All the time, wow. from the world, from the church, from the police. Yeah. When I first started preaching real hard out on the streets, it seemed every time I went out to preach, the police were coming to arrest me and threaten me with arrest. And, and uh, 
uh, you know, it just seemed like it was never going to stop. You know, it's become less and less now. I still deal with the police on a regular basis. But there was that testing period where I needed to overcome. So uh, every young preacher needs to be uh, aware of that. Everyone new to preaching would need to be aware of that. Uh, there's going to be a lot of opposition. You need to persevere and overcome. So you will be opposed, and you will be opposed by Christians, or professing Christians. And they're going to have objections to your preaching, especially if you're in a, a campus preaching, and uh, you have you know, question and answers and dialogue with the crowd. There's going to be a lot of opposition. Uh, so the first point I want to make is uh, why, uh, or just the fact that you will be uh, opposed. And uh, here we have in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 10 and 11. And it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, persecute you, Say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Okay, so persecution is part of the job description. It's to be expected. It doesn't say, blessed are you if men shall revile you, but when. And therefore, it's to be expected. And, you know, some people can be disappointed in ministry. You have such high expectations. And, uh, you know, the world's going to get saved. The church is going to uh, fellowship with you. And, and, and you can have a nice ministry and power and anointing. And, you know, you get these high expectations. Then reality sets in and you're disappointed. Why? Well, I've not been disappointed because I've had low expectations. <laughs> and if you have low expectations, you won't be disappointed. I expect the opposition. Yes. I expect the persecution. I expect the rejection. Yeah. And I felt God taught me that. God oh, taught well, yeah. me to expect it. Thank you, Jesus. And so, you know, when you're not disappointed, uh, then you're not going to be discouraged. It's true. And so you should have... Here, this is your realistic expectation. And if you have this expectation, what in the world could possibly disappoint you? Right. You know, if this is your expectation, yeah. you're not going to be disappointed. Amen. You'll get exactly what you're expecting. Amen. So you will be opposed. And you need to expect it. You need to accept it. So you need to come to terms with it. That's good. Secondly, uh, why are they going to oppose you? Uh, well, because uh, the Christians have a compromised message. Yes, they do, sir. You know, their message is a, a, a sin-accommodating message. Yes, it is. You know, and they'll say it out in the open air. Nobody's perfect. Yes, right. You can't stop sinning. God accepts you as you are. Yeah. And it's about as unbiblical as you can get. Yeah. Boom. Right. The notion that a holy God... Right. It, accepts unrepentant sinners as they are is as unbiblical of a message as anyone can conjure up. That's right. Yeah. And their message, because it is compromised, they hate your message. That's right. If you go out there with an uncompromising, uh, you know, true blue, uh, sharp and piercing, hammering word of God, they're not going to like it. And they're not going to want you to, to share it. Right. Because it's a reflection on them. If what, if what you're telling the campus is true, what they've been telling the campus is false. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And they don't want people to think that. So they're going to come out and say, this guy's a false prophet. This guy is a, a anti-Christ. This guy, you know, is a false preacher. This guy's not a real Christian. Because if you're the real thing, they're the phony. They're the fake. Mm -hmm. right. And so they're going to, they, they, they come out every, almost every time you go to campus, these, these compromised Christians will come out and try and convince the crowd, I'm a real Christian, he's not. That's right. I have the real message, he doesn't. Yeah. If you want to hear the real gospel, here, come to my meeting. Come to my church. Right. 
And that's what they do. Of course, I'm out there and I say, look, I'm not even out here to promote a church. I'm out here to promote Christ. Amen. Amen. And after about 30 minutes of this compromised Christian being out there, trying to, trying to share the real gospel with everyone, then suddenly he's gone. And I'm still there three, four hours later. So I tell the crowd, hey, where'd that loving Christian go? Why isn't he still here? You guys are still sinning. You're still going to hell. Why am I here and he's gone? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was just trying to cover himself. Right. To defend himself. Right. right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe get a few more people to come to his church. And they want to get along with the world. That's another reason they will oppose That's right. you. That's right. Yeah. They want to be friends with the world. That's right. That's right. The Bible said friendship with the world is enmity with God. They've never had a true conversion of a breaking off with the world, of recognizing just how wicked and evil the world is. And they want to just fit in with the world, to get along with the world. Many of the compromised Christians, you know, they grew up in church, and they've always had a heart for the world. Always. And their, their church experience has been nothing more than passed down religion, a cultural thing. Yes. Right. I remember the first time, you know, I got saved, well, when I got saved, the first time I joined a youth group, and uh, I thought, you know, naive, young convert, I thought everyone in this church was saved. I thought they were Christians. Right. You know, I, I mean, they... I thought they were angels. I, yeah, right. I, I, these guys Saints. have been in the faith for years, longer than I... You know, they've read the Bible. I just started, yeah. you know. And I these guys were all Christians. Yeah. 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 That's oh, right. We're all born again. <laughs> so then I started right. hanging out with some of these youth group kids who, you know, they read the Bible, they go to Bible study, they talk about God. And you know what they're playing in their car as we're driving around? They're playing the same old filthy music I listen to in the world. What? I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I thought, are you, why are you guys even going to church? Why don't you go live the way I was living? Right. That's what you really want. Come on. Why, why are you even in a youth group? In your heart of hearts. You want to live the sinful life that I lived. You envy that life. There you go. Come on. And that's where you wish you really were. And so it is that you know, they want to get along with the world. They want to be in the world. The fact is, they are the world. That's right. Yeah. Well, there you go. Of course, a true Christian, an open-air preacher, we're done with the world. Yeah. We don't want to get along with the world. We want to change the world. Yeah. Yes. Amen. We hate the system of the world. Amen. We hate the ways of the world. And the, God of the world. and the only reason we want to be among them is to change them. Not to be like them. Right. Not to be liked by them. Amen. But to change them. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So they want to get along with the world. And that's a compromise. And of course they will oppose you. If you go out there with a message of repentance. message of holiness. They will oppose you because they have sin in their life. And when you're shooting arrows of conviction into that crowd, they're the ones getting shot. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, they are. And they know it. And they don't like your signs because it condemns them. Right. They don't like your preaching because it condemns them. Yeah. And they've never gotten to that crisis point of conversion where they break themselves off of all of their sin and they yield their lives to Christ entirely and in and whole being submitted to God. They've never gotten to that point. And because they're compromised, living in wickedness and living in sin, they don't want to hear you. That's right. They want to That's right. shut you up. That's right. They are outraged. That's right. Now They have no problem with the sin of the world. And they're not going to confront the sin right there before their eyes on campus. They're going to confront you mm. for preaching against it. So you know, whenever you preach against sin, and someone comes up to you and says, this is not the right way to do it, you're offending people, that's translated as, I don't like it, you're offending me. Yeah. That's all it means. This won't admit it. So you will be opposed, and these are reasons why you will be opposed, but you know what? You want to be opposed. Amen. You want to be opposed. Right. Uh, the mentality of the church, many of the you know evangelistic programs, is that 
if you're being hated, if you're being opposed, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. And you better modify your message yeah, to make right. it more compatible with them. There you go. Seeker friendly. More seeker friendly. Yeah. But the truth is, if you're being opposed and hated, it's not a reflection that you're doing something wrong. Right. It's a reflection that you're doing something right. Come on. Because right, if I'm out there on a campus and I have 300 God haters in front of me who love their sin, who defend their sin, who are ultimately willing to go to hell for their sin. That's right. And they use the name of my Savior as a curse word. Yeah. yeah. If they like me and they applaud for me and they enjoy me, well, then there's something wrong with me. Amen. 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 If you're accepted by a sin-loving, God-hating crowd, right. you are wrong. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. And that's when you need to change your message. Amen. So you don't need to compromise and change your message or modify your approach if the world rejects you. You need to change your method or change your message if the world accepts you. If it accepts you. Yeah. Jesus said, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. you so did they of the yeah. false prophets. Amen. So if I'm out there preaching and the crowd says, we don't want to hear it. Nobody likes this. We hate this. I say, praise God. Amen. Because if I was liked by a Jesus-hating crowd, that I must not be like Jesus. That's right. there you go. Yeah. And then when the, one of these compromised Christians comes out, and everyone claps for him, and everyone loves him, and they say, we want to hear this guy, we like this guy. Yeah. Oh, there's something wrong with him. Wrong with him. That's right. Does he not notice these are the same people that were just blaspheming God, mocking the Bible, right. stripping in public, cheering for sex and sin and filth, and then he comes around and they, oh, we like this guy. Yeah. Oh, we like this guy. <laughs> and it doesn't even compute in that guy's mind that the same crowd that rejects Jesus is now accepting him. Yeah. And that's a problem. Yes, sir. So you want to be opposed. And God promised you would be opposed. And if God's word is true, it will happen and it happens. So what are the objections a lot of these people have, these Christians? They come out and, uh, you know, they'll ask you, well, what is your objective? They come out and they see, I mean, here's this hostile crowd. They're mocking God, mocking the preacher, loving sin, cheering for sin. And they're, they're thinking, this is, not, this is not accomplishing anything. These people don't like Christianity any more than they used to. They don't want to get saved any more than they used to. At least, you know, that's their thinking. They don't really know what's going on in everyone's heart. They see this mess out on campus and they think, what is your goal? And, uh, you know, of course, the, you know, when you're campus preaching, the whole objective is a dialogue. Right. You know, my target audience is not those who agree with me. My target audience is those who disagree with me. Yes. That's who I want to reach. So when the crowd says, nobody agrees with you out here. Say, well, hey, I came to the right place. Amen. That means I'm reaching my target audience. <laughs> That's good. If you guys agreed with me, I would just pack up and leave. I'm well, preaching to the choir. Yeah. The fact that you guys are uh, opposing me and don't like what I'm saying, well, hey, that means I need to come back again tomorrow. Yeah. Amen. You're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Woo. So a Christian will come out and say, what are you trying to accomplish? I'm trying to get people to talk about the Bible. Success! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about the Bible for hours. Yeah. Amen. I accomplished my goal. I'm trying to get people to talk to me about God. Yes. Success! Here's a, here's a crowd of sinners talking to me about Jesus. Yeah. Now, they might not like what I'm saying, but I'm accomplishing my objective. And of course, you know, to be obedient to God, give glory to God. My objectives are always accomplished. And uh, I'm trying to make the truth available. That's right. And I'm succeeding. Here it is. It's available. Or like Reuben says, someone will come out, how many have you led to Christ? All of them, he says. Yeah. <laughs> all of them. I've led you all to Christ. What you did with him, that's your choice. But I led you all to him. That's right. Amen. Then they'll say, Jesus didn't do this. 
And they're like, if Jesus came out here, do you think he'd be preaching like that? Yeah, he would. I say, no, I actually don't. I think he'd have a much better names to call this crowd yeah. than I'm going to come up with. Amen. Yeah. yeah, he would. He'd have much better names to call this crowd. He'd re be rebuking them with more hatred in his heart than I can. There we go. He'd be confronting them much harder than I am, I'm sure. Yeah. Of course, Jesus preached confrontationally in the open air. He didn't just go around, hang out with people. Now they say, oh, Jesus hung out with the whores. I say, yeah, that's why I came to this campus yeah. today. Amen. Yeah. Hey, I know there's so many whores on this campus. Oh. Yeah. Now Jesus, you know, the, the, the Pharisees accused him of being friends of sinners. All he did was talk with them, and that's to right. them that was being friends with a sinner. Right. So by the standard of the Pharisees, I would be a friend of sinner because I come to campus and talk to these people. There you go. Yeah. That's what Jesus didn't just hang out with them, buddy buddy with them. He preached to them. And he told them stories. He told them parables. And he said in John 7 7, the world hates me because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Evil. It wasn't just the Pharisees that hated That's Jesus, right. it was the world. <coughs> because he told them that their works were evil. Yeah. <coughs> Jesus certainly preached like this. All you need to do is read his sermons and you'll see how confrontational he really was. That's right. Yeah. He didn't just go around and say, God loves you, God loves you, God accepts you as you are. Right. No, he, the, you know, the phrase hell fire was coined by Jesus Christ. That's the first time you find the phrase hell fire right, in the Bible. Yeah. From Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about hell, yeah. but the phrase hell fire came from Christ. That's right. It came from him. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, or Christians will come out, you know, the, the super spiritual Christians who, uh, you know, they don't go unless God tells them. And they'll say, oh, you need to pray. You know, God, do you want me to go? Well, listen, God already told us to go. And you should go unless he tells you not to. Amen. In the book of Acts, the apostles right. were going to be going into Asia, and then the Holy Spirit stopped them. Yeah, that's right. Well, wait a minute. It, didn't they pray first? Didn't they ask God, should we go to Asia? No. God already said, go into all the world. They said, oh, Asia's part of the world. Let's go. And God had to stop them. So we already got the green light, right. and you're supposed to go unless you get the red light. How about right. that? Well, some people say, oh, no, you, unless God tells you specifically, go here, go there, go to this corner, go to that corner, then don't, don't go at all. So they'll come up to you and say, did you pray and ask God if he wants you to come to campus today? I liked, uh, Brother Jed gave a good answer. I heard him uh, recently. And he said a, a student came up and asked him that question. Did you ask God, do you want, did he want you to come to campus today? He said, no. Are you kidding me? I've been doing this for 40 years. He said, can you imagine an employee every day asking his boss, boss, do you want me to go to work today? Okay. <laughs> boss, you want me to go to work today? Uh oh okay. Boss, you want me to go to work today? <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine that happening? No. God gives you a job, you do it. Amen. And you don't ask him a second time. Do you want me to do you want me to do the job today? Do you want me to get it done today? <laughs> oh. No, you just go and get it done. Amen. No, of course I didn't ask God, do you want me to go to campus today? Amen. He hasn't told me not to go, so I'm going. There you go. And if he wants me not to go, he'll let me know. Sure will. All right. All right. I'm gonna be going into all the world. So that's one of their objections. Did you ask God? Did God tell you to come here? Of course, they'll, uh, they'll use the Holy Bible to justify their unholy life. Right. They don't come out there with their Bibles to teach the world about Jesus, to show the world how they need to repent, to convict them in their hearts. They come out there with their Bibles to justify their unholy lives. Yeah. And they're, they're searching for a justification to, you know, for their wickedness, to refute this preacher, to, to pacify their conscience right, mm -hmm. for their compromise and sin. And they think they found some verses. And of course, Romans chapter 7 is one of the great strongholds of the religious sinner. Yeah. Yeah. Romans chapter 7. Oh, look, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. He said, well, I do that which I would not. And what I... <laughs> 
would I do not? Right. Look, yeah. Paul himself, this is the climax of the Christian life. Falling down the stairs. Uh -oh. And they say the best you can hope for is a life of sin, a life of compromise, yeah. like the Apostle Paul supposedly had in Romans 7. Well, first of all, the interpretation that Romans 7 is the Christian life was absolutely foreign to the ch early church for the first three to four hundred years. It's not until Augustine, not surprisingly, not until Augustine, Romans 7 was viewed as the Christian life. Because in his debates with his opponents, and his view of total depravity of the sinner was not compatible with Romans chapter 7. Well, if Romans chapter 7 is the sinner, Augustine thought, how can it say, well, I delight in the law after the inward man? Of course, the inward man is an expression signifying the conscience. Your conscience delights in the law of God, even as a sinner. That's why, you know, movies of heroism... You know, even a sinner can, can uh, uh, praise the hero and, rec and, and disapprove of the bad guy in any classic story of good and evil. Even the conscience of a sinner right. approves of the law of God. If it didn't, he could never be brought to conviction. He could never be convicted. Right. Romans 7 is a description of a convicted sinner whose conscience has been awakened by the law of God, <clears throat> whose conscience wants to do right, and his conscience delights in God's law. Now, while uh, people are confused with the present tense, well, if I can tell, I, I, I can tell stories and say, uh, so I'm out there on campus, and I'm preaching the gospel, and I'm preaching it hard and strong, and a, here's a sinner, and he's in my face, and he's screaming at me, and he's yelling at me, and he's not liking what's going on. See, I'm telling you a story of something that happened in the present tense. That was all present tense. The fact that Paul uses the present tense to, use the, to describe this narrative doesn't mean that's his current life. Right. In fact, he starts off by saying, I was alive without the law once. Sin revived and I die. So he starts off telling this story of what happens then when the law comes and convicts him. And he's using the present tense. If you study the Greek, you'll see a lot of the Gospels use the present tense to describe what happened uh, you know, when, in Jesus' ministry. That's right. you know, the King James, when it says, saith, if, if it says, Jesus saith unto her, mm -hmm. saith is a reflection of the Greek present tense. Right. That's why it has the TH at the end. That's why I appreciate yeah. the King James. The Amen. Most. Amen. I think it's the best English Bible that we have. And so all throughout the Bible, they use the present tense to tell a narrative. Romans chapter 7 was not Paul's life. That man was convicted by his conscience. And what did Paul say more than once? I have a conscience void of offense, even unto this day. Yeah, that's right. The man in Romans 7 did not have a conscience void of offense. <coughs> he had a conscience that convicted him and condemned him. Hmm. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. <coughs> Paul lived a holy life. That's right. Or they use uh, another scripture. Paul was the chief of sinners. Mom, <laughs> yeah. Mom. Well, in context, he's reflecting on he was a blasphemer, or a persecutor yeah. of the church. That's the, that, those are the verses before he said, Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Yes, sir. That means of all the sinners that he saved, he was the chief. He was now saved. He was no longer a blasphemer and a persecutor of the church. If Paul lived as literally in his present Christian life as the chief of sinners, well, how hypocritical was he for casting out the insensuous Corinthian? Come on, brother. Or for saying not to keep company with any brother who's a fornicator. Oh. Right. How hypocritical of Paul if Paul himself was the chief of fornicators. The chief the chief of, you know, insensuous perverts. Yeah. So they think they, they can use the Holy Bible to justify their sinning life. They need to properly explain these verses. And you know, uh, show them what God says and what Jesus said to go and sin no more. Uh, let's see how much. They have uh, more objections, of course, that are 
theological in nature. They have a theology that accommodates their sin. Well, Jesus died for all of our sin. Therefore, all of our sin, past, present, and future, repented of, repented of or impenitent, it's all forgiven. It's all under the blood. Well, certainly not. The atonement was a provisionary nature. It was provisionary in nature through which sin can be forgiven. doesn't mean all sin is forgiven. Otherwise, the whole world would be saved. The Bible says Jesus died shedding his blood for the remission of sins. Yet after the atonement, it says, repent for the remission of sins. So here, uh, it shows a provisionary nature that Christ made a way for your sins to be remitted, and yet in order for them to actually be remitted, you must repent. <coughs> and uh, the Bible says not to cause your brother to, to stumble or not to cause your brother to perish for whom Christ died. So those whom Christ died for can perish. They, they try and make the atonement into nothing more than a license to sin. Right. It accommodates their impenitence. When Paul said to the church in Rome, after your heart and impenitent heart, treasure up for yourself wrath. That will be revealed in the day of wrath. Right. They say you're turning these people off. Is that right? You know, the Bible, uh, the Bible talks about um, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Amen. And uh, how does that happen? Well, because he... He came, he sent Moses to a proud man with high demands and then even brought these miracles before his eyes. And the result of that is that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And because of what God did, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It's not that God just, you know, zapped him, hardened his heart, but that in response to what God had been doing, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. The Bible even says, I think it's in Amos, where he told one of his prophets to go and make these people's hearts hard. Right. Just keep preaching and preaching and preaching. Make their hearts hard. Yeah, that's what they're doing today. Well, that's what happens when you preach the gospel. When you're encountering the truth, Amen. you either soften your heart and receive it, or you harden your heart and reject it. And the Bible says their eyes, they have closed. Their ears are dull and hard of hearing. Their hearts have waxed hard and gross. And so it is that, you know, in response to what we're doing, they are hardening their own hearts. So when they say you're turning people off, well, I'm not, I mean, I don't have magical powers to just go into their heart and turn it, to harden it. Yeah. But in response to what I'm saying and what I'm doing, they're hardening themselves. They're rejecting it themselves. But my job is to make it available, whether they receive it or reject it. And knowing many will reject it, many will harden their heart to it. Nevertheless, God tells us to go because a few will be saved. Yeah, yeah. That's good. They say, you're just entertaining these people. Well, since when did Christians care about entertaining sinners as if that's a bad thing? They have all their rock concerts, all their <laughs> Christian musicians that are just trying to reach the world by entertaining That's them. That's right. Their Christian movies that are just trying to reach the world by entertaining them. Youth groups who are trying to attract the lost through all the fun and games and entertainment. Well, why do they suddenly have a problem with me out on campus preaching in a way that's entertaining these sinners? Yeah. Touche. How hypocritical. Amen. Self-contradictory. Right. So that's an internal critique there. Yeah, that's pretty good. Assuming it's assuming their own position that hey, what's wrong with entertaining? Right. Yeah. They say nobody is listening. That's the funny one. <laughs> Nobody's listening to you. Obviously not. Why are you out here? Why are you listening to I remember just the other day someone was like, Oh man, the battery on my iPhone just died filming everything he says. <laughs> he, he was really disappointed, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, so here he, his battery died because he wants to capture everything that I'm saying, and yet they come along and say, nobody's listening to you. Yeah. I like the best when they come out, someone's just walking by, and they're, you know, they're far away, and they're like, nobody's listening to you. Why are you here? No one's listening to you. I said, wait, wait, what was that? What did you say? They said, nobody's listening to you. I said, oh, I got you. You listen to what I just said. You can how did you answer my question if no one's listening to me? Amen. That's good. <coughs> or uh, you know, same thing, 
someone will say, what's wrong with homosexuality? I said, well, do you know how they have sex? They're like, yeah, sure. I said, well, can you describe it for us? Can you tell the crowd how these people have sex? She said, no, that's disgusting. I said, I got you! Let's say, you can't judge. Of course, we know that one. Matthew chapter 7, 1 to 5, you know, you're supposed to get the log out of your own eye, get the sin out of your life, then you can see clearly to remove the speck in your neighbor's eye. So some Christian will come up and say, well, you can't judge. I said, well, do you have sin in your life? He says, yeah. I said, well, then I can judge you, but you can't judge me. That's right, brother. That's what that verse is saying. Amen. And the Bible says, judge righteous judgment. Amen. Amen. You know, and they'll say, you can't judge. I say, yeah, that's right, so stop judging my judging. Amen. <laughs> Why do you tell me my judging is wrong if you're not supposed to judge? Amen. Don't judge my judging. Don't condemn my condemnation. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's good. And uh, I was preaching at the University of uh, Northern Iowa recently, and a, guy, a, a Christian came out with their Bible. And, oh, I just want to read a Bible verse. All right, go ahead. <laughs> I... Romans, or uh, Matthew 7, verse 1 to 5. Just read the whole thing. And then they didn't give any commentary. They just closed the book and walked away. No commentary. And the crowd was silent. Like, you know, how are you going to respond to that verse he just gave you? And I said to the crowd, I said, Well, there you have it, folks. You need to stop judging me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that Christian left it open. They never gave their commentary. The crowd assumed it was a message for me. I just turned it around. No, that's a message for you. You got logs in your eye. Amen. Well, right, do you have to come out here and start judging me? Amen. You're trying to find the speck in my eye. Right. You're, you're yes. searching for some type of compromise and sin in my life. Yes, yes. And they're like, well, don't you speed? Do you have a shirt with two different fabrics? Do you eat Oh pork? yeah. Just trying to find a speck somewhere in my yeah. eye. Oh. All the meanwhile, there's this huge log in their eye. Yeah. Lord. That's right. They say, you make us look bad. Yes, I do. Because you're so compromised. Right. Yep. You got so much sin in your life. Of course, I make you look bad. Praise God. That's good. And uh, someone will come out and say, You make Christians look bad. Good. Right. Come on, brother. Oh, you make and then they start cursing me out. <laughs> <laughs> F you and all this other stuff. And then I turn to them and say, You make Christians look bad. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh, sometimes you get opposition from the police. I was preaching in uh, Shreveport down in front of a club, and an officer came up to me. He said, go across the street. I said, oh, no, no, I'm not going across the street. And I, was on the, I was on the street, and I said, oh, I'll get up on the curb, on the sidewalk. You don't want me in the street. He said, no, go across the street. I said, no, this is where the people are. This is a city sidewalk, city street. He said, you're debating these people. I said, yeah, I'm, you know, trying to have a dialogue, debate with them. Right. He, he, said, he said, if I find you debating these people again, you're going to jail. Wow. wow. I got it all on video. I said, what? I said, that's my right. I have the right to debate them. He said, if you debate them, you're going to jail. Wow. I said, are you going to arrest them for debating with me? Come on. Come on. If they start debating with me, he, and he was, you've been warned. And walked away. <laughs> Should have arrested him. He was debating with you. That's what I was thinking afterwards. <laughs> he and I were having a debate. Yeah. You're under arrest. <laughs> Put him under some citizen's arrest. <laughs> arrest. Yeah. Debating. Yeah. 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 An officer has told me, look, you have free speech until people get offended. Okay. <laughs> Where? Where is that so? You, you can't speak once they get offended. That's disturbing their peace. I say, officer, what you're telling me right now is offending me. You are disturbing my peace. Right <laughs> what right do you have to tell me that? You're offending me. <laughs> you need to stop telling me that. Yeah. He's like, uh, Yo, oh yeah, he blows his mind. He just, <laughs> yeah, he, he wants to apply that principle to you, but don't dare apply that to him. Right. Uh, let's see, let me wrap this up. They say, you know, you're not loving. Of course, uh, love is not a sensation and a feeling. Love is a committal of the will by rebuking them and warning them. 
yes. and pleading with them to repent, that's true love. They don't recognize love. They don't know what love is. Right. You know, they can't even define love. I remember another campus preacher, a uh, person came out and said, well, where's the love? This isn't loving. So can you define love? She said, no, you can't define love. You, it's undefinable. <laughs> And he said, well, don't use words you don't know the definition of. <laughs> then you're using words without meaning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That was good. <laughs> so they say, you know, this is not the gospel. They don't know what the gospel is. They think the gospel is God accepts you as you are. That's right. Uh, there's been times they say, you're not preaching grace. You're not preaching mercy. Where's the grace? Where's the mercy? There's times I, I focus. You know, if I'm on a campus, say, three days, I might focus the first two days on judgment, wrath. Of course, I'm mentioning forgiveness and repentance, but my focus is judgment and wrath. Then on the third day, I might focus more on, you know, God's, wi God's willingness to forgive and God's uh, heart for salvation. He'd rather save a soul than to damn a soul. Yeah. I might focus on that the third day. And yet they'll still say, you're not preaching mercy. You're not preaching grace. You're not preaching forgiveness. And I'm thinking, are you just deaf, dumb, and blind? I mean, what do you think I've been doing all day? Like, that's been my focus. I, I don't, I've mentioned mercy and grace and forgiveness, you know, more than any other day on this campus. And I, I thought, well, maybe they're just, they're hard of hearing. I mean, you know, you, you, you mentioned judgment, and they're so, you know, it's so foreign to them. They're not used to hearing that. That's just... Right. So when you start yeah. talking about mercy, it's like they don't even hear it. Correct. Right. Right. Then I realized, you know, they have a very different view of mercy than I do. Mercy to them is God accepts you as you are. That's right. Yeah. You don't have to change. Yeah. You're going to go to heaven just as you are. And I never did preach that. So by their definition of mercy, yeah, I'm, I never did preach mercy. Uh, yeah. My mercy was always conditional upon repent. Amen. And then uh, you're just yelling and screaming at them. You're just yelling. You're just screaming. So, no, you don't want to hear me yell. Yelling is louder than this. Yeah. You don't want, and then you're just angry. No, you don't want to see me get angry. Yeah. When I'm angry, I'm worse than this. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I'm, no, I'm projecting my voice. I'm raising my voice that everyone could hear. There's hundreds of students out here. Jesus preached to 7,000 people. You don't think he raised his voice? Yeah. I said, you guys, you go to your concerts with your rock music and your yeah. rap music blasting your ears. You get your, you know, your headphones on blasting out your eardrums. You don't mind all that loud filth, but oh, a loud preacher can't have that. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Man. right. Or, uh, oh, I love it when some angry, compromised Christian comes out, starts yelling and screaming at me. You're turning people off! This is not the right way to do it! Jesus didn't do this! <laughs> I said, why are you so angry? Do you think you're going to change my mind yelling at me like that? <laughs> oh, it totally just blows their mind. They don't even see their own hypocrisy. Then they think I'm being hypocritical. They don't sometimes recognize the sarcasm. <laughs> So you're offending them, you're doing more harm than good. Friendship is a better way. Uh -oh. I was preaching at Yale University. Uh, I have preached there a few years in a row, and students started recognizing me, so I showed up, you know, the next year. And students walking by, oh, Jesse's back. Hey, Jesse. Was having a real impact on that campus. I was told uh, there was even a, um, oh, what is it, like a... a, a a gathering on campus where you know people go on stage and perform like a talent show, and they had some Jesse Morell impersonators. I guess <laughs> <laughs> the Yale talent Thieves. show. Oh yeah, Thieves and Robin. made a big impact on that campus. So you know when I was on campus, every day they did an article, like three days in a row they did an article on me. And then even after I left, I ended up adding up all the articles, like eleven articles in their oh. newspaper. Like these people have nothing more to talk about than the preacher that came to They're campus. They're not listening to you, months bro. Ago. Oh, no one's listening to you. Yeah. I ended up having a pretty big uh, impact on that campus. Well, one year, went out talking to a man. And he said, well, what are you trying to accomplish? I mean, seriously, what do you want? I said, I want to put the fear of God in these people. Amen. I want to put the fear of God in them. Amen. And, of course, I want to tell them about Jesus, that they might fall in love with God and recognize how God loved them. They might love him in return. Yes. 
He said, well, I have friends who have heard you in years past. And they've stood out there and listened to you preach. And, you know, they don't fear God now. They don't love God now. I mean, what did you, you didn't do anything with them. You didn't win them. And he's, and he's trying to say, you know, this confrontational approach obviously isn't working. This open air thing obviously isn't working. What's better is a more friendship approach. Be friends with people, and, and you're more likely to win them that way. I said, oh, is that right? I said, now, these, these people that heard me preaching, these are friends of yours. He said, oh, yeah, they're friends. I said, I mean, are they like real friends, long-term friends, short-term? Oh, no, long-term. I've been friends with these guys for a long time. Yeah, what'd you do? I said, oh, is that right? And I said, and they don't love God. They don't fear God. No, no. not at all, he yeah. said. Not, not at all. No. They don't love God or fear God at all. I said, oh, so you, you're telling me you're going to criticize me for not accomplishing in a few days what you've been unable to accomplish in a matter of years. Yeah. Oh, about that. Good. Uh, he tried to change the topic. I said, yeah, no, 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 get back. And he said, okay, I see your point. I see your point. Wow. Wow. Touche. So, uh, awesome. you know, I, they say friendship or talking one-on-one -on -one is better. You know, when I talk one-on-one, -on -one, the sinner might be more tamed, but he still hates God in his heart, and at the end of the conversation, he still rejects the gospel. He might reject it in a more pleasant way. You know, well, you have your viewpoint. I have my viewpoint. You know what that means? I'm rejecting the gospel. I'm not going to accept what you just told me. So he might be more uh, aggressive in his rejection when I'm open air preaching. But even in a one-on-one, -on -one, those same sinners are still ultimately rejecting it. It's true. So, uh, that's not necessarily a better way. The best way to reach the most amount of people, to reach the masses, is open air preaching. Yeah. It's God's, God's way. Uh, and so you're going to have opposition from Christians. One of the best ways to deal with it is I have a policy on campus. I am not taking questions from Christians. And so I have a question. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Oh, I'm not here to talk to Christians. I'm not here to, you know, try and defend what I'm doing. I'm here to do it. Yeah, it's good. I'm only taking questions from sinners. I came not to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Are you a sinner? Yes. Oh, well, I don't believe you're a real Christian. What's your question? <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of ways to do that. And, uh, uh, well, let me um, close. Does anyone have any opposition or objections that they've faced that they have uh, maybe want me to think about or share some thoughts on? Any uh, questions? I, I do have, a, like, a comment, something yes, sir. that the Lord has shown me is that you know, as these the ranks of the open air and campus preachers grow, because they have been growing uh, over the years, uh, it used to be just a handful of preachers, and now there's dozens, uh, I, I realized that I would hear recurring uh, opposition from the organized campus groups and groups that are in different regions, because preaching all over the country you run into different peoples, but the same people most of the time, and usually they have the same responses, so... What the Lord was showing me is that, you know, these campus groups especially, they get real mad when you show up, correct? Oh, yeah. And they got and they don't know what to do. So what they're doing is they're going back to their leaders, their, you know, their their campus group leaders, their, you know, uh, campus pastors, and then they're so uh, what I'm realizing is they are definitely strategizing to come up with ways to oppose us publicly as we come out to preach on the campus. And so I think as time goes on, we'll see emboldened uh, religious folk uh, come out, stand up, oppose, and literally try to, you know, defend that position that they have. And you made a good point that, you know, if we're right, they're wrong. So as we shame them, they're going to get more inflamed yeah. unless they repent and come in to the, to the body. Uh, they're they're going to figure out ways more and more and strategize to oppose us in a more organized way and try to be more effective in that opposition and ultimately, you know, it's going to get worse and worse. Yeah, these, these Christian groups on campus, they get offended because they think this is, this is our territory. That's right. These are our students. We have our ministry here. You're, you're an outsider. You have no right to come and preach to these people. These are the people we're reaching. You're, you don't need to come here and preach because we're doing it. And, uh, of course, they're not doing it right. Right. Uh, they're not open-air preaching, they're not confronting sin, they're not calling people to repentance. 
uh, they're not doing it right, so it is necessary for us to come. But I'll talk to them and I'll say, oh, okay. I said, now, you know, are you like a freshman here or a senior? What, what, what are you? Oh, I'm a sophomore. So you've been on campus for, for two years now. Right. And you think this is your campus. I've been preaching on this campus for eight years. How about that? I was here before you got here, and I'll be here long after you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> so don't tell me this is my campus, these are my students, you're on my territory. If you love these people, well, you know, you're just going to minister while you're here, and then you're gone, buddy. I'm going to stick around. There you go. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. Um, this is just a thing that 